In the previous lesson, you learned that during the opening stage of the game, you should focus your attention on the center, you must develop your pieces as quickly as possible, and you should make the castling move to make your king safe and get the rook out of the corner. Once you've completed those tasks, the opening is complete, and then you reach the next stage of the game, the middle game. Usually most of the fighting action happens during the middle game, and in this lesson I'll show you three things you should do in the middle game, and also three things you shouldn't do. But before we continue the lesson, I want to remind you that when you play chess, you should always be careful. You see, the thing is, if you make 10 or 20 good moves, and then you make one bad move, then usually all the good moves you made becomes undone. And since there are so many pieces on the board during the middle game, it's easy to overlook something and make a mistake. I'll say it again, be careful. Don't make it easy for your opponent to beat you. So with that said, let's continue the lesson by looking at three things you should do in the middle game. The first thing is that you must try to make as many threats as possible. In chess, we say you put pressure on your opponent. It's usually a very good idea to make a threat. Because when you put pressure on your opponent, then you increase the chances that they could make a mistake, which could allow you to win material or make a good exchange. When you make a threat, your opponent is usually forced to deal with that threat. And that also means they don't get the opportunity to make their own plans, because they must first find a way to stop your threats. So if you can make a threat, it's often a good idea. But of course, you must first check that your opponent doesn't have any threats against you. Otherwise, if they do, you must first deal with their threat. Let me show you a few examples of what it means to make threats. In this position you'll notice that even though white's bishop is partly developed, it isn't doing much here. And you can move it here to attack black's queen. This means your bishop moves to a better position and at the same time you are making a threat. Black should move his queen. Let's say he goes to b6. Now white can make another threat and at the same time develop his rook. By bringing the rook to the open file. Black should move the queen again. Let's say he goes here. And now, once again, white can make a threat with another one of his pieces. He plays knight to e5, threatening to capture the pawn on f7, and also threatening to capture the bishop. Now, due to all the pressure, black could be nervous by now, which could possibly cause him to make a mistake. For example, you may be thinking, I need to protect the pawn. And then he moves the rook here, but forgets that you can capture the bishop. But if black stayed calm and thought about the move, he would find that he can move the bishop back to e6 and at the same time defend the pawn. But even so, you can see how white made progress by making threats, whereas black never got a chance to do anything since he had to deal with all the threats against him. That is why it's such a good idea to make threats. But and this brings me to the second thing you should do in the middle game. If you can't make a threat, then see which of your pieces should be further developed. At this stage, it's important to understand the difference between a passive piece and an active piece. When one of your pieces isn't well developed, as is the case with this rook, then we say that the piece is passive. It means that the piece isn't doing much and you should try to improve the role of that piece. You can make this rook more active by moving it here. Because now at least he helps to defend the knight and he also attacks these important squares in the center. So if you can't make any good threats, then try to make your passive pieces more active. You will also notice that when your pieces are more active, then there will often be more opportunities to make threats too. The third thing you should do in the middle game is to chase away your opponent's pieces if they get too close. The reason for this is that when an enemy piece comes into your territory, then usually that piece becomes very active, and that's why it would be a good idea if you can neutralize it, either by chasing it away or by exchanging it. Here's an example. Black moves his knight here because he has in mind to move it to d3 on the next move. I'm sure you can see that if the knight gets to d3, it would be very active. He would be threatening the pawn on b2. Also, your rook will not be able to come to e1 because the knight will be attacking the square. So, all in all, it would be a problem for white if the knight lands on d3. And that's why white decides to exchange his bishop for the knight. If he doesn't do this right now, for example, if he plays the rook here, then black will put the knight on d3, and it would be a very active piece. Also, 
How are you going to get rid of the knight? You can't chase it because these pawns can't move backwards. And also you can't exchange your bishop for the knight anymore because the knight is now in a light square and the bishop can only go in the dark squares. Also you don't really want to exchange your rook for the knight later on because that would be a bad exchange. However, if you eventually need to get rid of this knight, then maybe the only way to do so will be to give your rook for it. That's why in this position, white should make this exchange right away, before black moves the knight to d3. Here's another example. Black moves their rook here, and now it becomes very active. He's also threatening to capture your pawn, because the queen will protect him if he does. When your opponent's piece becomes active, then you should chase that piece away or exchange it. White can make a very good move here. He plays the knight to d4. Attacking the rook and at the same time defends the pawn. The black rook must go back to a safe square, probably here or here. So the three things you should do in the middle game is to, first of all, make threats when you can. Secondly, develop your pieces to more active squares. And third, chase your opponent's pieces or exchange them if they become too active. Now I'll show you three things that you shouldn't do in the middle game. The first thing you shouldn't do is don't exchange your most active pieces for your opponent's passive pieces. Here's an example. White's knight is very active and is well placed in the middle of the board. Black's bishop on the other hand is not very well developed and it is quite passive because his own pawns blocks his way. That's why, even if this would be an equal exchange, white shouldn't do it now, because at this stage the knight is active and useful, whereas the bishop isn't. Don't exchange your active pieces for your opponent's passive pieces, unless you're winning points. In that case, you should probably do it. In this position, I'll show you the second thing you shouldn't do in the middle game, and that is, you shouldn't move your pawns unless you have a good reason to do so. In particular, Avoid moving the pawns in front of your king, because it would expose him and make your king vulnerable. This doesn't mean you never move the pawns. Sometimes it is acceptable to move this pawn on the side, because in this case there's a clear purpose. You want to chase away one of your opponent's active pieces. But be careful not to open up your king too much. Now let's shift our attention to the queen side to explain something. I want to illustrate that your pawns prevent enemy pieces getting too close to your territory. For example, this pawn covers the d3 square and prevents black putting his knight there. But if you then move this pawn, then black can place their knight on and you won't be able to chase it away with your pawn because your pawn can't move backwards. So the lesson here is, unless you have a very good reason to do so, don't move your pawns because it usually weakens your position if you move a pawn without a purpose. But as I've said, sometimes there is a good reason to move a pawn. In this case, there is a good reason to move this pawn. It will help to defend the pawn on e4, and at the same time, it will open up the diagonal so that your bishop can develop. It's okay to move your pawns, but only if you have a very good reason to do so. And even then, you should be careful about which pawns you move, because remember, they can never move back again. The third thing that you shouldn't do in the middle game is that you shouldn't waste moves. What do I mean when I say don't waste moves? Well, when you aren't sure what to move, you may be tempted to just move anything. That would be wasting a move. Try not to do that. Rather think about the things you learned in this lesson and try to find a useful move. To conclude this lesson, I'll quickly summarize it. You learned about three things you should do in the middle game. Try to make as many good threats as possible. Develop your passive pieces to more active squares. And if an enemy piece gets into your territory, try to chase it away or exchange it. Then there is also three things you shouldn't do. Don't exchange your active pieces for your opponent's passive pieces. Don't move your pawns unless you have a good reason to do so. And lastly, don't waste moves. Rather think a bit more and try to find a useful move. In the middle game, many of the pieces and the pawns will eventually leave the board as they get exchanged or captured, and when there's only a few pieces left, we reach the end game stage. In the next lesson, I will show you how to find good moves in the end game. I'll see you there.